Welcome to What's the Scenario with PLRB, where we explore claims and coverage scenarios relevant to insurance professionals. I'm Alicia Watley. I'm Tim Havler. And I'm Mike Broad. Okay, Tim, what's the scenario? A young couple lives together in St. Pete, Florida. Their friend was vacationing in Italy for a month and asked them to dog sit for her three-year-old pit bull rescue who had a checkered past, but was doing well lately. Uh, The couple agreed, took in the dog. Uh, One night they threw a dinner party, and out of nowhere, the dog bit a guest on the leg. Ouchie. Blood everywhere, including on the expensive white wool carpets. The guest got his leg treated at the hospital. He was fine and not suing. The couple now is making an insurance claim to replace their blood-stained carpet under Section 1 of their HO3 2011 ISO form. So, Mike and Alicia, I'm sure I'm going to get some hate mail from the Pitbull community for creating this hypothetical, and that's okay. But as it's anyone just ever... hypothetical. <laughs> right. Has anyone ever been bitten or owned a dog? that bit uh no and quite honestly that dog probably had a reason to bite the person i'm just saying (laughs) well hang on a minute alicia because i'm a yes when i was a poor paper boy one of my first jobs 12 years old and my neighbor down the street had a what was a german shepherd and when i dropped his paper off his house was kind of up here if you can tell by my visual hand movements here and then the next house i had to deliver to was back here and then there's this fence line that was only about two and a half feet tall and this dog was like ten thousand pounds and about seven feet tall mm-hmm. so he would run up and down that fence line because it wanted to eat me every day that i was delivering the paper then he got his chance one day i went to collect money from my neighbor he was in the garage with the dog feeding it i drove up on my little bike dog looks at me I look at the dog, it comes tearing after me, put my arm up and whoop, big old German Shepherd bite to my arm. Oh, so, ouch. Yeah. A bit. I don't, still don't well, like German Shepherds much. Well, that's what you get for trying to collect some money. <laughs> I owe first paper, Alicia. It's my job. Fine. <laughs> you gotta watch out for those German Shepherds. They're scary. But that's my story, Tim. Yes. Any stitches, Mike? No, thankfully, I just kind of punctured the skin a little bit, and I made my collection, was scared to death, and then uh, rode my little bike home. And then you quit your job? I kept it for a while, but yeah, I always made sure that my neighbor knew exactly when I was coming over and that the dog was secured, yes. Fair enough. Okay. (laughs) I've never had a dog. Uh, My mom didn't believe in pets, uh, so I haven't had any issues with, you know, dogs biting me because dogs love me. And uh, yeah, it's dogs are the best, better than cats. Come at me if you want. We're talking about an exclusion of losses caused by an animal owned or kept by the insured. So can we explain what is owned or kept? What does that mean? Yep, that's the first exclusion we think of owned are kept by the insured, basically an exclusion for pets. Um, now, in this claim, was that dog owned by the insured? No. Nope. Nope. Owned by the friend. But was that dog kept by the insured? Yep. I'm going to say yes. I think there's probably sometimes some gray area here. Say if a friend brings over their dog and stays for two hours, but the friend stays with the dog at your house. Mm-hmm. I don't think then you're keeping the dog. But when you have say a dog by yourself for four months, I would say it's fair to characterize that as being the keeper of that dog. So owned or kept by the insured, we're going to say yes on that um, aspect of the exclusion. I guess I'm looking at it, Tim. So I'm the adjuster trying to figure out why would, you know, why do you put an exclusion in a policy? Well, you try to put an exclusion in to cover things that are just kind of normal wear and tear, things that can be expected, not fortuitous, I guess. So I'm thinking with a dog, 
you're thinking there's weird things dogs do. They chew stuff up, they rip stuff up, tear some things up occasionally. When they get anxious, maybe uh, they have an accident on the floor or something. Who's saying it happens? Those are the kind of things you would think might be excluded by the policy. We wouldn't want to cover that, but this seems to be blood coming from the dog wouldn't be normally or expected. So do you think the exclusion was it meant to apply to a situation like this? It's a good argument. And to your point, Mike, that exclusion is grouped in with wear and tear and deterioration and settling and all those other kind of long-term, gradual, normal, expected type of exclusions. So when it's with those, you wonder if we should be interpreting it for dogs chewing and, like you said, whatever dogs do. It's a little bit different. You don't really expect this to happen. It's more fortuitous. Um, I think that's a fair argument. Now, I have seen two courts, neither in Florida, uh, one was Michigan, one was the Ninth Circuit, Oregon, that rejected that view. They took the literal approach, said the exclusion says loss caused by animals, owner Mm. kept by the insured. This loss was caused by animal owner kept by the insured, so they didn't buy into the whole comparison to wear and tear. They went with a literal approach. Doesn't mean every court would do it. So just to clarify, this was the gentleman's blood and not the dog's blood, right? This was the gentleman's blood. The dog was unscathed. He was the attacker. So maybe since it's his blood, was that caused by the pit bull pup or was this guy just had a he had thin skin, Tim? That's what it was. <laughs> it seems like a pretty direct line to me from the bite to the blood. Um, when there's a big separation and a lot of things happening in between, I could start to think along those lines, but this was awfully direct. You bite someone, blood comes out. I think you're probably going more to an ensuing loss argument. Oh, uh, yes, Tim. I was going to more of an ensuing loss scenario. And how might that come into play here, sir? Okay, ensuing losses, because... These are asked about so often. This is a good one to go over. Um, Policy says losses caused by pets excluded, but losses that ensue from pets are covered. Sounds a little strange. Let's say that once more. Losses caused by pets are excluded. Losses that ensue from or result from pets are covered. Hmm. Now, I've always thought this is a hairline distinction between the words. It's not really clear where you draw that line. So mostly what courts do is they look at the degree of separation between here the pet and the final damage. So let's go, what's something that would definitely be covered in suing loss? Um, Dog knocks over a candle, candle lights the bed on fire, a whole house goes up in flames. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's steps here, and the fire is a totally different thing Mm -hmm. from the dog. So we're going to say that's ensuing. Now, the reverse, what's definitely not ensuing would be like, Mike, you said before, the chewing and the drooling and the normal dog stuff. Now, our claim's kind of in the middle, so someone's going to have to make the call. Is it separate enough? I went back to PLRB's database to see what we've said in similar situations. And here's what we've said. So we had dog chewing up ballpoint pen, leaving an eight inch stain on two day old rug. We said ensuing covered cat rubbing against the faucet, turned it on, overflowed the sink water loss. We said Mm. ensuing. Cat knocks over lamp, which smolders carpet. Surprisingly, we said ensuing. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these could be argued either way. It seems like in the past we've been generous in giving the ensuing loss status to a lot of these. Uh, What PLRB thinks or thought is not binding case law. What I think or say Mm -hmm. is not binding case law. Mm -hmm. So then the adjuster's thinking, okay, well, then what do I do? Yeah, Tim. Now I'm confused. Well, um, <laughs> the bottom line is, can you reasonably argue your position? Can you convince that judge or that jury that you're right? Um, it's a 
future moment. It's unsatisfying sometimes that there are no hard answers. But one thing you can do is look at the state law. So you go to Florida and suing loss cases. Sometimes you see a trend that, oh, this is a broad interpretation or now they've been more of a narrow interpretation, but it's still uncertain and different companies will deal with that uncertainty differently. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a business decision. You just got to be consistent in interpreting what an ensuing loss is and take your position and move forward with the claim. But Tim, you said in this scenario, the gentleman was not suing. So how could it be ensuing? Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> All right. Got it. Got it. No, no. I'm like, I didn't like that laugh. <laughs> okay. We need one more dad joke before the end of the episode. I'll work on it. You got a time limit. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to throw a little question out there. Um, we're talking about, you know, blood, guys not suing. Um, that's fine. Is there an exclusion for pollutants? Would blood be considered a pollutant? Pollutant. We've talked about pollutants before in the podcast. Is blood a pollutant? Great question. That's the other exclusion we can look at. Um, pollutants is based on the idea of contamination. So could you say the carpet was contaminated? Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, the HO3 does define pollutants, although... I don't know how helpful it is. Pollutants means any solid, liquid, gaseous, or thermal irritant or contaminant, including smoke, vapor, soot, fumes, acids, alkalis, chemicals, and waste. Waste includes materials to be recycled, reconditioned, or reclaimed. So the argument would be that blood is a contaminant, which is in this definition. It's a liquid contaminant. Both of those words are in the definition. It's a common question we get. It's a terrible fact pattern, but... Mm -hmm. You know, at least a, not a month goes by where some adjuster doesn't submit a question to me where the uh, claim is that an insured died in their apartment or house and they lived alone and no one knew about it. So the decomposing body then contaminated the house. It's a tough one. PLRB used to say that the pollutants exclusion was a reasonable basis for denial here. Uh, we base that on the broad definition, case law interpreting it broadly, but we've also recognized it's a tough situation. It's an emotional situation. So again, this is one where companies kind of adopt their own position. Um, now, this has changed quite a bit in the last year with a 2023 case from Florida, which is where our hypothetical is. Uh, this case, this court pretty clearly said human blood not a pollutant. Hmm. They read that definition and kind of thought, uh, technically maybe it fits, but it's really not what this was intended for. And that should be obvious to anyone who reads it, that court thought. Hmm. Um, that's only Florida, other jurisdictions, it's still good to take note. So now I think it's a little bit more of a 50-50 than it used to be now with that Florida case. It, it's a tough one. And then, of course, with the pollutants exclusion, if there's a coverage C peril here, then it definitely can't apply. Mm -hmm. Coverage C peril for vandalism. But as we've said in prior podcasts, mm -hmm. animals cannot commit vandalism. Are you sure? <laughs> Except for the bear who steals your food. <laughs> and your Bears are very smart. Yes, they are. Just yeah, like so you. Would be. The coverage C <laughs> exception isn't going to do us any good there. All right. So do we, so do they get to replace their bloodstained rug? <laughs> uh, maybe. Or a day, maybe, huh? It's a big maybe. I think on both of those exclusions, it's a big maybe. Hmm. And, you know, in Florida, if you're in Florida, I definitely would not use the pollutants exclusion. But other jurisdictions, maybe. And then, of course, the animals exclusion. Again, you're in that big, messy, ensuing loss stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, they agreed to keep the dog for a while. You know, they can replace a nice dark colored rug. <laughs> I think that's exactly that's the issue right there, Alicia. Never go with a white carpet. Are you kidding me? That's Who does crazy. that? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> 
But in their defense, they didn't have a dog. They were just keeping a dog. <laughs> That's true. So, I do wonder if it's sort of like the pen example that you gave, Tim, though, right? I mean, if a dog chewing a pen leaks on something and that's ensuing loss, mm -hmm. a dog chewing on somebody's leg causes a little blood spill, sounds awful similar to me. I agree. I don't think there's much of a difference there. So I, it's not unreasonable either way. It's just mm -hmm. that that's what they said then. Very good. All so right. that's one where yeah, you might uh, use your best investigation, talk to your team, research it, and then make your best business call. All right, Tim. So what can we take away from this scenario? To recap, the insureds were dog sitting for four weeks. The dog bit a guest causing blood stains on the carpet. Is there coverage for replacing the carpet mm -hmm. under the ISO HO3 2011 section one? The exclusion for animals owned or kept by an insured is a possibility, but there are significant questions regarding whether the blood would be an ensuing loss. The pollutants exclusion could be another argument to make in some jurisdictions, but not in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a 2023 decision from an appellate court in Florida that held human blood is not a pollutant. So Mike, where can an adjuster go to learn more? Of course, you can always check us out at plrb.org. Look under a couple of coverage questions that deal with these very issues, just like we talked about. So the dog causing some sort of a blood issue. We've had pollution exclusion and how it applies to animals. And the question also is if blood or bodily fluids are a pollutant under coverage aid dwelling. You can find all that fabulous stuff under coverage questions at plrb.org. Alicia, could yeah. you throw those in the show notes, you think? Of course. Uh, yes, we can uh, share those uh, and do a recap in the key of the key points in this episode in the show notes. Uh, links to our social media are also there and information on how you can submit your own adjuster story. So don't forget to subscribe and rate us and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this resource are those of the individual speaker and not necessarily those of the Property and Liability Resource Bureau, its membership, or any organization with which the presenter is employed or affiliated. The information, ideas, and opinions are presented as information only and not as legal advice or offers of representation. Individual policy language and state laws vary, and listeners should rely on guidance from their companies and counsel as appropriate.